Well, we have some great speakers for you today and then some great uh, take-home uh, reminders for you. So we're going to get started. Uh, I've asked all of our speakers to keep their remarks to about six minutes. Uh, one of my speakers, Joe Bass, is going to leave uh, the conference and I will tell you the reason he left is because a great scientist really soon uh, is under attack by the left. And um, he asked Joe to come up uh, to uh, be with he and his family for a couple of days as they're working through all these uh, attacks. So uh, Myron is going to replace him and uh, talk a little bit about some of the fabrications uh, of the people we're talking about today. But I'm going to go through all of the uh, introductions of the people who are speaking and then ask them to just come up uh, in order. And um, uh, then at the end, I'll be making some remarks and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and we'll go through the final points that we have on the board. Our first speaker today is Congressman Bill Flores from Texas. Uh, not all Texans are experts in energy, but this Texan is. He was elected to the House of Representatives in November of 2010, and he's serving his third term, representing the 17th Congressional District of Texas. He served on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. He's a ninth generation Texas, raised in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, he uh, has a, an MBA, a BBA in accounting. So uh, he's a really smart guy, and he does know about energy as well. He served three decades as CFO, CEO, or COO of several companies. Uh, he's been married for 36 years. He now resides in Bryan, Texas. And um, he is going to be our first speaker today. Our second speaker will be Myron Ebel. Myron is the director of the Competitive Enterprise Institute Center for Energy and Environment. Uh, which is a tremendously successful advocate uh, for free market environmentalism. He chairs what is known here in town as the Cooler Heads Coalition. It's an ad hoc coalition of 28 nonprofit groups that question global warming alarmism and oppose energy rationing policies. Uh, the Business Insider commented that Myron Ebel may be enemy number one to the current climate change community. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Myron comes from Oregon, where he grew up on a cattle ranch. He earned degrees at Colorado College and the London School of Economics. Our third speaker will be Andrew Langer. Andrew is president of the Institute for Liberty, where he has been since 2008. Um, the Institute works on a variety of issues promoting and protecting small business, linking trade and prosperity, tilting against the regulatory state. Uh, but at the organization's core and Andrews, his desire is to promote freedom and individual rights. He's been involved in this uh, battle for nearly 20 years, and um, he used to be a regulatory affairs lobbyist to the National Federation of Independent Businesses. So today he's going to talk to you about the importance of citizens being involved in the regulatory process. Our final speaker is Gary Broadbent. Uh, Gary is the Assistant General Counsel and Media Director at Murray Energy Corporation, the largest privately held coal company in the United States. If you've been warm this winter, thank Gary. <laughs> Don't thank me, thank you, Cole <laughs> Gary is uh, representing his boss today, Mr. Murray, who had to go into the hospital, which was a surprise to all of us, and our thoughts and prayers are with him. At Murray Energy, Gary is responsible for a wide variety of legal matters, including environmental, regulatory, and mine safety litigation, uh, commercial transaction, financial reporting, and some government affairs. Uh, he got his JD from Case Western Reserve Law School, uh, and he'll be our final speaker. Uh, and then I'll come up and talk a little bit about principles and why principles are important, and we'll go through our action items for the day. So, Congressman Flores, welcome to the podium. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Becky, for the nice introduction. I want to uh, start by uh, saying one of the things that, that Becky didn't say is I'm, I'm honored to be the chairman of the Republican Study Committee. It's the biggest, most effective, most passionate group of conservatives in Congress. And uh, we've got three members of the Republican Study Committee staff with us today. Let me get this loaded up real quickly. Thank you. Wrong cover. Oh, it's on the desk. Okay. So, okay. There you go. I didn't realize it's already been copied. Thank you. 
But y'all didn't think I could drive with, did you? <laughs> Anyway, and some of us old guys can do that. Anyway, I'm pleased to have three members of the Republican Study Committee team with me today. I've got Caitlin, Cameron, and Kelly. So you guys hold your hands up. Uh, they're with me. They helped. Uh, they were integral along with my team back in my personal office to help put this presentation together. Uh, as you know, what the the, uh, the title of the panel is climate. What time stare? What Tom Steyer is it telling you? And uh, I think it's important for us to know what he's not telling you. Uh, first of all, I want to say this. It's great to be at CPAC 2015. It's an honor to see so many passionate conservatives that care about this country, the greatest nation on this earth, that want to stand up for the freedom that was hard fought and then want to preserve it for generations to come. It's also great to see our newest, youngest generations of conservatives here and so passionate because you're where the future is in terms of advancing the conservative cause moving forward. Let me start off by saying this. In order to have a great American future, we've got to have energy security. And this administration has done everything it can to stop or thwart American energy production. Now, the private sector has been able to overcome those headwinds, but it's getting tougher and tougher. And at the same time, they're trying to stop domestic energy production. They're spending billions on failed green energy programs like Solyndra. We've seen that. Now, there's a lot that Tom Steyer won't take about the, the obama steyer climate objective or the, the climate agenda that, that many uh, liberals have. And here are the six tr inconvenient truths about that agenda that I think you need to know. It kills U.S. jobs. It costs trillions of dollars. It's based on junk science. It's based on fantasy technology. And it uses manipulated cost-benefit data. And last, and it doesn't even pass the smell test. And we're going to go through a little of each of these. now. Yesterday, I got to sit through a hearing with EPA Administrator Jean McCarthy, and all she kept telling me was, just trust us. <laughs> okay. So let's have a little audience bumping. How many, how many of you don't trust the EPA? Okay. <laughs> me too. Now, we're supposed to trust the bureaucrats of Washington and liberals like Barack Obama and Tom Steyer know more about how to create jobs and, and live our lives than we do. And... We know better. Who makes the regulations that we're supposed to just trust? Well, until April of 2013, the EPA's top climate expert was a man named John Beale. How many of you have heard that name before? Okay, well, the rest of you are going to find out about this guy. He was a close advisor to the EPA administrator, and he wrote many of the climate regulations over the past several years. Now, where is John Beale today? The graphic says that he's in jail. In late 2013, he was sentenced to 32 months in jail for falsely claiming to be a CIA, CIA officer at a Vietnam vet. <laughs> for 13 years, he lied to the EPA and to the American people and defrauded taxpayers out of nearly $1 million by pretending to take secret spy trips in lieu of fulfilling his duties at the EPA. Now, sorry, President Obama, I don't trust your bureaucrats any farther than I throw them. Now here's some more inconvenient truths. Let's go through the individual inconve inconvenient truths about the uh, Obama energy agenda. It kills Americans' jobs. Now there are a lot of different things I could talk about. I could talk about multiple agencies, I could talk about multiple laws, but I'm going to focus on two. One are some ozone regs that came out recently, and the second are waters of the U.S., which came out a little earlier last year. The Friday after Thanksgiving, a big news day, the EPA rolls out its new ozone regs, and they want to propose a 20 and 25 percent cut in ozone levels. It's the most expensive regulation ever in the history of this world, point blank. By 2040, it would cost nearly 3 million jobs. And here's what it simply does. It increases the cost of doing business in America beyond what is reasonable. And when you increase the cost of business beyond what's reasonable, people, people move elsewhere and they take American jobs and paychecks with them. And so while we do this, Obama is exporting American jobs to China, India, and other countries with your regulations, and they send us their pollution. So no matter how much the EPA tightens U.S. standards, foreign-produced background pollution is going to come back in this country, particularly from Asia, traveling across the Pacific Ocean, including our environment. So again, this is what the, the liberal agenda wants to do with climate. They want to export our jobs and import their pollution. The, the next inconvenient truth is it's going to cost trillions of dollars. 
Every day we feel the impact of their out of control regulations. We feel the impact when we fill up our cars, when we heat our homes, and when we check our electric bill. Protecting jobs and then keeping energy costs low are two of the best things that we can do to help struggling American families today, more of whom are living paycheck to paycheck than ever before. By 2040, the EPA's ozone emission standards will eliminate three and a half trillion dollars in economic output. Now, how much is three and a half trillion dollars? If you stack three and a half trillion dollar bills together, together you get almost 85% of the way to the moon. It only costs NASA $110 billion to get to the moon. If the EPA wants to touch the moon, it ought to call NASA instead of what it's doing today. <laughs> now, the EPA climate agenda is based on junk science. The EPA justifies its strict ozone standards by saying that they can improve health benefits for Americans. But their assumptions are too often based on faulty science. There was a recent medical study that found no link between ozone and higher asthma rates in U.S. cities. Now, why is that? It's because we brought our ozone levels way down today under existing standards. The study did find, however, that poverty, not ozone, is the most single important determinant as to how, whether a person is more likely to have asthma. So if you really want to improve people's health, killing jobs, raising their cost of living, and putting them in poverty is the absolute last thing that Obama should be doing. Now, the EPA climate agenda is based, oops, I need to go back one. It's a little quicker than that there. The EPA uh, climate change is based on fantasy technology. And just to summarize this, here's what the EPA says. It says they don't know how to get to their, to their proposed lower levels because the technology doesn't exist. In their last standard, 67% of the control technology that they want to use to achieve these standards doesn't exist. Not to worry with the EPA. They said, but it'll only cost about $15,000 per ton of ozone reduction to get to that level. What's the real world price today for ozone re reduction? $175,000, $250,000 per ton. So it's, it's junk economics, too. It's fantasy technology. So as the standards get tighter, the more unrealistic they become. The background ozone level at Yellowstone National Park is 66 parts per billion, higher than the proposed standards. That's, if we, what are we supposed to do? Close the park to visitors? If we did, that would change the ozone level. We're talking about profound changes to how our American economy operates, all based on assumptions instead of reality. We'll talk more about this during Q&A. The EPA agenda uses manipulated cost-benefit data. There's a name for what the EPA does. It's called regulatory malpractice. It's interesting to note that the EPA's economics for its latest ozone proposal excludes the cost of ozone reduction in California because the EPA assumes that California will not meet the ozone standards for the foreseeable future. So we can't just pull them out of the equation. And so, now, do you think it's because of economics or because California's a blue state and Tom Steyer lives there? How many of you think economics? How many of you think politics? Okay, I'm with you. Six, the EPA climate doesn't pass the smell test. The EPA ridiculous regulations can just pour on ridiculous. Let me say it this way. And the waters, the EPA is proposing to change the definition of the waters of the U.S. from navigable waters to virtually every piece of water that's around here. So if, a, if rain falls in a farmer's field, they think they can regulate it. Now, what should we do? Let's stay involved. You can tell Tom Steyer what you think about what he's doing by going to Twitter. Find out Tom Steyer and use the hashtag, tweet at Tom. You can tell that Barack Obama the hashtag bring back our energy. And I'd like to hear from you too. That Rep. Bill Torres, thanks for having me today. I look forward to hearing your questions. Good afternoon. It's great to be here today. Uh, I want to thank uh, CPAC uh, for inviting me to speak uh, with this uh, distinguished panel. Thank you, Becky, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, uh, it's a cold day, and uh, it makes one, uh, one's thoughts turn to global, global climate disruption. Uh, I want to start in 1992. That's when President Bush flew to Rio for the Earth Summit and signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That was when the uh, leaders of, of almost every country in the world decided to put a noose around the global economy. And it has taken some decades to tighten that noose, but it is starting to get tight. 
The next step after 1992 was during the Clinton administration when Bill Clinton and Al Gore cooked up what became the Kyoto Protocol. Now, you will recall that the US Senate never ratified the Kyoto Protocol, but if you want to thank President George W. Bush for that, that's okay. But in fact, he did virtually nothing to stop the tightening of the noose. So we go next to President Obama, who is part of this agenda. I don't know why. Uh, he, as a legislator and a senator, he was never interested in environmental issues. Oh, I do know why. It's how you take control of the U.S. economy through environmental regulations over energy use. If you control what kind of energy people can use and how much, you control the economy. So, that's where we got to the beginning of the Obama administration. I want to shift now and tell you just a couple of things about the science, and then also a couple of slides that uh, Joe Bast might approve of. I'm sorry he's not here. But for anybody in the room who's under 18 years of age, you have not experienced any global warming. Right? There, there has been no global warming for the past 18 years. No increase in the global mean temperature. What has there been? There's been an increase in the model projections of how much warming there should be. All those squiggly lines are computer models. This was put together by John Christie. The little, the little dots and, and uh, triangles at the bottom are the satellite temperature data and the balloon temperature data. They agree quite closely. They don't agree with the model projections. Now, and since we've all had some science in school, some of us here are scientists, when confronted with this kind of divergence, what do you do? Do you trust the models or do you trust the data? Trust the data. No, <laughs> so you trust the models. That don't every 97% of the world's planet scientists say, trust us, we've got the models and we know it's going to get warmer. So if the models and the data don't agree, you switch the data. Here's, here's something that NASA GIS did. Uh, the top graph is the old temperature graph for the United States from 1880 to 2010. And they just made the 1930s a lot cooler so that the past two decades look a lot warmer. So remember that. It's good science. If the data and the models disagree, go with the models. Uh, here's, a, here's an example of the kind of deception that we've lived under. This is the infamous hockey stick that Michael Mann fabricated and that it took somebody outside of the climate science community to discover the statistical sleight of hand that resulted in this, in this so-called hockey stick. Uh, now, let me just say, what is the result of all this climate change we've seen and all these CO2 emissions? Well, starting in, seven, in the 18th century, we had a steady state world, steady state in terms of CO2 emissions, per capita income, and life expectancy. Since the modern energy revolution began, and we started emitting a lot of CO2 from burning coal, oil, and natural gas, the world is a much happier, healthier, more populated place. Everything is going up. Now, a look at this. Uh, the, the middle, the dots, that's this increases in CO2 levels. It, it tracks pretty closely with increases in food production. The increase in temperature is down on the bottom. It doesn't track well at all. So, what is Obama up to? He is pursuing global warming policy, not just at EPA, not just against the coal industry, as, as Gary Broadbent will talk about at, for Murray Energy. He is every single department of the U.S. government, every agency now has climate programs. The Department of, the, of Defense now claims that global warming is the greatest national security threat. Next to right wing extremist zones. Yeah, well, okay. John Kerry, the Secretary of State, his first speech as secretary was about how climate change was going to be his number one priority 
as Secretary of State. He gave that at the University of Virginia Law School. Now, this might explain why we have these problems around the world, because we have a Secretary of State and a President who are focused on global warming and not on what they consider to be lesser problems. So we have here, uh, I just want to summarize my key points. I was told to bring three slides, so I brought 10, but here are the three. <laughs> the science is settled, global warming is not a crisis. The energy rationing policies being implemented are much worse than the impacts of global warming. The president is pursuing policies that have little support in the Congress or with the public, and the polling and the voting shows that. And uh, I just want to focus on one regulation, or two, the, the, the regulations for new and existing power plants. Those are the ones that have got coal-fired power plants. If he gets away with this, if Gina McCarthy and the EPA can do this, if they can finalize this re these regulations without Congress overturning them or without the Mur Murray Energy lawsuit blocking them, they will turn all of the growing heartland economies like Indiana, Ohio, Texas, Kentucky, they will start looking like California and New York because the purpose of those policies is to raise energy prices. They've already done that in California with Governor Schwarzenegger and Governor Reagan. They've already done that in New York. They've already done that in New England. Which economy do you want to live in? Moreover, there's a, there's a political difference between these two worlds, right? There's John Shetty, who represented Arizona as a Republican. Well, Arizona has affordable energy. It's a Republican state. Which states don't have affordable energy? They're all the states that have implemented this climate uh, agenda. So, uh, for more information, here's where you go. But I want to tell you how to take action. Uh, just, we were supposed to have very simple things. So, tell your senators and representatives to vote for an appropriations writer to block the EPA's clean power plant. And tell your state legislators that the state should tell the EPA, no, we're not going to do it. And finally, if any of you doubt what this is all about, sometimes somebody on the other side lets it out of the bag. Some years ago, Jacques Chirac, when he was president of France, said, this is about a lot more than climate. This is about, this is the first genuine instrument of global governance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christiana Figueres, the extremely capable uh, head of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, said this month, and I will stop with this quote, this is probably the most difficult task we have ever given ourselves, that is the UN which is to intentionally transform the economic development model for the first time in human history. So if you think that this uh, agenda is about uh, saving the planet from global warming, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a much bigger and more sinister thing than that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, I, want to, I want to sort of give some further cost context to what the congressman was talking about, a little bit about what Myron was talking about, uh, in terms of regulatory costs and talk about some regulatory tools. And then given the fact that Joe Bast did fly to Boston to uh, uh, lend his friendship to Willie Soon, I want to talk about the role that this debate has in the overall war on oppositional and conservative speech uh, and the dangers that this poses and tie it into a, a something called Operation Choke Point. Uh, first off, as we talk about these costs, we know what they are in the macroeconomic sense. We know that every five years, the U.S. government, the U.S. government itself, not some crazy right-wing think tank, produces a report on the cost of regulation, the direct cost of regulation, to the American economy each year. Uh, we know that in 2005, that number was just above $1.2 trillion. We know that number skyrocketed between 2005 and 2010 by an unprecedented 35% to 1.75 trillion. We know that that translates down for America's smallest businesses to about $11,000 per employee per year, which has a direct impact on jobs, as I know we'll talk about. Uh, the important thing to recognize is this does not come without some great cost. Re regardless of where you are on the economic spectrum, you can be a, a, a von Mises free market Austrian economist who believes that government needs to get out of the way, uh, or that government needs to uh, produce fewer taxes, or you can believe in Keynesian economics that government needs to prime the pump. But the fact is we have right now a roughly $2 trillion hole in our American economy. Actually, I think when the report comes out later on this year, that number is going to be somewhere about $2.3 trillion annually. 
a massive hole in an economy that is only $15 trillion in size. So the point is, when these agencies enact these regulations, uh, we need to be getting involved. I want to talk about, and the Congressman touched on this a little bit, he talked about cost-benefit analysis. There's another tool that I like to talk about, which is comparative risk assessment. My father's an environmental scientist. This is something that he raised to me when I was a kid. It's the idea that you should compare regulatory decisions against not doing something, or doing something different, or something that's being done somewhere else. So it's not just about whether or not the benefits of a regulation outweigh the cost of it. That's, uh, that only tells you if it's fiscally responsible. But comparative risk assessment tells you that when you raise the cost of energy on poor people, more poor people get sick, more poor people die. It has a direct impact on, on huge swatches of the economy overall. And it lets you prioritize what's important. Because frankly, if you ask most environmental scientists, regardless of this fictitious 97% number, Global warming is not the number one priority amongst even environmental scientists in terms of the greatest threats to public health and the environment. It's clean water worldwide. And yet you don't hear that in the mythos that's out there. Most importantly, thank you, Donna. Most importantly, what you need to do is get involved. Myron talked about writing a member of Congress. I want you all to take down regulations.gov, the most important website you can visit. It's an area in which we don't play very well. You can comment on regulations. Anybody can comment on regulations, regulatory proposals that are coming out of the agencies. And so you file your comments. And frankly, I urge you all, when you create your comments, create them for your friends. Send out links with your model comments to your friends and urge them to, to send comments in as well. It's the only way you can get involved. It's the only way you can challenge a regulation once it's implemented. It is something the agencies, if you file comments of substance, the agencies have to respond. And then frankly, the numbers of comments that are out there is something that is talked about on Capitol Hill. Now, I'm going to leave it for the Q&A. I hope somebody asked me about this, because I want to talk about the denigration uh, and the exposure uh, and, 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 and the war on conservative speech and how this all relates to it, and this issue of Operation Choke Point. But I'm going to end right here. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gary Broadbent. As Becky said, I'm Assistant General Counsel and Media Director for Murray Energy. In case there's any doubt, I am not about her. <laughs> Mr. Murray uh, caught a flu bug, as Becky said. He's out of the hospital now and, and on the mend. So uh, thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Um, I've come to you today from, from St. Clairsville, Ohio, which is a little town of 5,000 people in, uh, in coal country, Belmont County, Ohio. We're nine miles from the Ohio River. Uh, we are 30 and 45 minutes from two of the most highly productive coal mines that we have in the United States. Uh, I spent the first two years of my career with, with Murray Energy working out of one of those coal mines. And I, I wish that I had good news for you, but, but I don't. Uh, the Obama administration has fundamentally destroyed the United States coal industry. <coughs> Before Obama took office, coal represented 52% of our country's electricity generation. It's down to 37% today, and it's falling fast. 411 coal-fired power-generating units have either closed or been slated for closure between now and the end of 2016. 47% of the coal mines in central Appalachia have been closed. We've lost over 101,000 megawatts of coal-fired electricity. That's going to be, that, that's enough electricity to power over 100 million American homes. And what this all translates to are job losses. There have been tremendous job losses in, in the coal fields of the United States. There are thousands and thousands of coal miners that are, that are out of work. And when those mines shut down, there's, there's no other job in the area. The average coal miner in the state of Ohio, where I'm from, earns $85,000 a year. That's more than I made graduating from law school. They, once those jobs are, are gone, you know, some of the coal miners, some of our coal miners, don't have high school degrees. You know, coal mining's their passion. It's their profession. It's all they know how to do. And once 
the mine closes, once the coal industry shuts down, there's no way that they can replace that income. There's no way that they can provide for their families like, they, like they've done in the past. We have 7,500 employees at, at Murray Energy. And I know Mr. Murray thinks about them every day. I think about them every day. I can guarantee you that Barack Obama does not think about them at all. Coal is the most affordable, reliable, and abundant source of energy that this world has ever known. We ought to be embracing it. Historically, coal has cost about four cents per kilowatt hour. Natural gas, by comparison, is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Wind and solar is 22 cents a kilowatt hour, and that's after billions of dollars of subsidies from you and me. These increased energy costs hurt manufacturers and people who work for them. They hurt people who are on fixed incomes, our seniors. And they hurt people who are poor. I, I grew up poor. And I know what it's like when the power company shuts off your electricity. And I know what it's like to be in a house that's cold and dark and without power. There's one billion people on the earth today that have no access to electricity. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And yet Barack Obama has wished it on every single one of us. Andrew Myron, Representative Flores and Peggy have talked about how there's no environmental benefit from, the, from these regulations that have been imposed. Instead, it's just tremendous cost. It's been sadly our economy and holding us back from true recovery. It's nothing short of a political power grab of America's power grid. That's what Mr. Murray calls it, and he calls it right. But Murray Energy Corporation is fighting back. Today we filed four lawsuits. Thank you. We filed four lawsuits, two of which preemptively challenge the Obama administration's clean power plan, so-called clean power plan, which is really a cap and tax regulation of existing coal-fired power plants. Those two lawsuits have been recognized by the Wall Street Journal as two of the premier litigation initiatives against this administration and so overreach at least in, in the environmental arena. We're going to oral arguments on April 16th, just over here in the D.C. Court of Appeals. Yes. And I hope to see you all there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We have more fights in the pipeline. I won't touch on them today. But I, I want to invite you to, to join our fight, to educate yourselves about the coal industry and the challenges we face, to contact your senator, your senators, your congressmen, your uh, governors, your state utility commissioners, and let them know that this, uh, this all-out war on coal, this power grab of America's power grid, has got to stop. They've got to cease and desist. Finally, we, we have to elect a pro-coal president in 2016. Someone who's going to protect and defend coal miners, protect and defend their jobs, and defend the most affordable, reliable source of energy that this world has ever known, American coal. Thank you. Well, I think all of our speakers did a great job. Uh, we want to have some time for questions. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple things that I think it's important for us to remember as we, uh, you know, as we're uh, leaving this room and going out to fight again another day. Uh, one is you need to be able yourselves to debunk the myths. Most of everything you've heard today debunks myths that Al Gore and Tom Steyer, Steyer and his ilk uh, have put out there. One of the things I think is important for you to have in your library is this book. Unstoppable Global Warming Every 1500 Years by Fred Singer and Dennis Avery. If you do not have a copy of this book, you need to get one. You need to read it. You need to understand the basis uh, for the facts we're arguing for and the lies and misrepresentations we're arguing against. 
And then you need to remember that principles need to guide us on public policy. Uh, we have a guiding set of principles for this country, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. When you're dealing with environmental policy, you have to have a guiding set of principles. Heritage has worked with a, a lot of scholars, and we've come up with 10 uh, principles that are outlined in this book, The American Conservation Ethic. You need to get a copy of this and be thinking about principles that will guide you if you think about these issues and you talk to friends and neighbors. And then you have to come up with solutions. Poor Congressman Flores is on the Hill. Thousands of things are going on every day. Uh, everything's coming over the transom. They're looking for solutions. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, again, has worked with a number of scholars, some at this uh, very table, to develop the Environmental Policy Guide, 168 recommendations for environmental policy reform uh, that's available on our website. Find solutions that you can really uh, grab onto yourselves and talk about at the Rotary Clubs and then communicate effectively with your elected representatives at all levels about principles and solutions. Now, we want to open this up for, uh, for questions. If you have a question, do raise your hand. I'm going to invoke the one breath rule. You have to be able to ask your question in one breath. Uh, the last point I want to make to you is, you know, we're fighting a battle in this country right now about net neutrality. In fact, we may have lost it by now. You know, net neutrality is a goal by this administration to keep you from getting the truth. This is just an example of an environmental fight. It's not in the environmental field. So look around and see how many fights out there affect your ability to get truth and be a good citizen uh, of this great nation. Okay, I see uh, Peter one breath. Does the Congress have the power to repeal these regulations under the Congressional Review Act? Congressman. Uh, yes, we have the power, but no, it's not feasible today, and here's why. Under the Congressional Review Act, we have the ability to introduce a resolution to veto a set of regulations. The, the practical problem is, is that the president will veto the veto and therefore the regulations stay in place. What we proposed in the last two Congresses, and we'll propose it again in this Congress, is a better solution called the RAINS Act. And the RAINS Act would, would, would work this way. It would basically say, Congress passes a statute, the rule makers write the rules. The rules don't go into effect until Congress affirms the rules if that particular uh, set of rules would exceed a certain dollar value of economic impact. Wall Street Journal said the Reagan's Act would be the single biggest uh, change, uh, improvement to the regulatory structure in this town that, that the country has ever, or that the, the government's ever had available to it. Uh, hopefully someday we have the right president and we have a 60-vote uh, margin in the Senate, or the vote margin changes in the Senate, then uh, we can uh, we get the Reigns Act in place and we can, we can stop these regulators from dead in their tracks. Okay, yeah, yes, right here. Identify yourself, please. Sir, my name is Mike Scudder. Uh Two years ago, I wrote an article for the Huffington Post about Bob Murray, who was Ken Ricciardi's top contributor in Virginia out of the global warming record, and I called him an extremist. I was sued for that. It was called defamation. Now, I wanted to know, in relation to Operation Choke Point, is it both offensive and defensive? Are you trying to silence your critics by following these meritless lawsuits that tied me up in court for the better part of a year? That was definitely more than one breath. Yeah, that was a sermon. I, I, I can tell you this. Mr. Murray started Murray Energy Corporation from scratch. He mortgaged his home to buy his first coal mine. He started that company in 1988. He's, he started out working underground. He has built a company now that employs 7,500 people. He's built a reputation that is second to none in this industry. And it's a reputation that we're going to defend from statements like you made. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm Charles Marshall from Dayton, Ohio. How does Tom Steyer benefit economically from all the regulation you that? Well, I mean, Tom Steyer is a, uh, uh, is a billionaire based in California. Uh, he heavily lobbies Congress for uh, a green energy interests that he himself benefits from. 
And, and so essentially, it's, it's a two-way, it's a two-pronged strategy, it's sort of the ultimate in crony capitalism, right? He argues for greater regulation on his competitors, and then he, uh, he works to get subsidies for his green energy boot novels. So he, he makes that on both, in both ways. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Langer. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the denigration of uh, Republican oppositional speech? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is an ongoing theme in this administration, and it, 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 you know, it's, it's different from what this gentleman is talking about. In terms of the fact that it, it, when, this, when this administration has opponents, when the left has opponents, they go after the funders of it, uh, they want greater exposure of, of who is going after this so they can bully people into no longer funding uh, critical, uh, uh, critical research and research that uh, is skeptical of anthropogenic climate change. Uh, operation Choke Point is a joint operation by the Department of Treasury, the Department of Justice, uh, the FDIC, and the, um, uh, and the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, it's one that has been used to go after industries that the uh, administration has no statutory or regulatory authority to shut down, yet as the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee just reported, uh, that the administration has a personal animus against. We believe, the Institute for Liberty, that an Operation Choke Point style tactic could be used to silence uh, conservative organizations and anybody who's advocating for uh, issues and on issues that an administration declares to be fraudulent, using this mythical 97% uh, consensus number. Someone can declare that uh, skepticism and advocacy for skepticism to man-made climate change is tantamount to committing fraud. We also think that given what they want to do in terms of getting at, in any way possible, uh, carbon emissions, that Operation Choke Point could be used to uh, shut down the bank accounts and credit card payment processors of those engaged in the energy industry and who are deemed polluters by the administration. Thank you, Andrew. This lady right here in the front row, you have the last question. I wanted to ask about the carbon sequestration. Uh, when the EPA talks about something that doesn't really technologically exist effectively, uh, do they mean carbon as in the element carbon, or are they talking about tracking CO2, a highly unstable gas? Yeah. Look, they're, they're talking about taking uh, carbon dioxide from a smokestack produced by burning something, typically coal, but it could be natural gas or wood, and piping it somewhere underground. Uh, it, it, it's technically feasible. I mean, there are pilot plants, but the EPA claims it's a proven technology for, for uh, which is why they are requiring it for coal-fired power plants. It, it raises the cost of electricity, however, and moreover, uh, carbon dioxide is, is a naturally occurring gas necessary for life on Earth. And we have 400 parts per million in the atmosphere, but in our lungs we have more like 40,000 parts per million. Undercurrent under the surface makes the mainstream get so nervous. It's time for purpose, for news to serve us. Not with propaganda they use to hurt us.